rocket science is famously technical and abstruse. Like brain surgery, it's uh, the sort of thing you, you don't expect the average person to do. And certainly there are not a lot of, of amateur hobbyist brain surgeons in the world. But in fact, there are quite a lot of very sophisticated, um, uh, technologically adept amateur rocket scientists in the world. So how did this happen? And, 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 uh, and how can we use this, uh, this amateur rocketry, model rocketry, to, uh, to see the principles of rocket science in practice? Serious amateur rocketry in the United States began about 60 years ago with the founding of the NAR, the National Association of Rocketry. And uh, it was founded um, to promote amateur rocketry throughout the country. And it did this in several different ways. It uh, gave a forum for amateurs, hobbyists, to exchange information. Um, they sponsored contests. Uh, they helped set uh, industry standards. And uh, they also codified the best safety practices so that the... Um, the, the hobby and sport of amateur rocketry has remained uh, a remarkably safe um, endeavor to this day, considering that you're dealing with explosives. Now, one thing that the NAR is interested in is what we might call low-power rockets. Um, and uh, these are engine types A through F. We'll talk about engine types in a bit. And to build and fly these rockets, you don't need a special license or special training. You just have to figure it out yourself and and, and try not to hurt yourself. And there are lots of manufacturers for the components of these rockets. There's Estes, Quest Aerospace, Apogee, and so on. But um, uh, in addition to low-power rockets, there are also high-powered rockets. These are engine types G through J. Now, if you want to build these, that usually requires um, some training and some certification from NAR. And these rockets generally go high enough that to launch them, you'll need clearance from the Federal Aviation Administration so you don't hear, hit any commercial aircraft. Uh, and the main manufacturers of components for this type of rocketry um, include uh, Aerotech, which makes uh, um, very high-powered uh, um, rocket motors. How, how powerful are the rocket motors? Well, the, um, the specific impulse of a black powder rocket is generally between 60 and 100 seconds, and the low-power rockets generally have black powder as their, as their propellant. But the, um, um, the high-powered rockets usually use something called ammonium perchlorate composite propellant, APCP, which is the same stuff they used in the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle, and such rockets can have specific impulses of 150 to 200 seconds, and so their, their performance is much higher. To explain the classification system for model rocket engines, let's start with sort of the typical motor that we might use in a rocket that we build. Uh, in the engine type A83, that's our workhorse. That's the, that's the uh, kind of rocket motor that we buy in quantity. Um, and uh, so what does that A83 mean? First of all, you might remember that A indicates the total impulse of the rocket. A means that the total impulse is between 1.25 and 2.5 newton seconds. And each successive letter is twice the total impulse. So B is between 2.5 and 5, C is between 5 and 10, D is between 10 and 20, and so on. Uh, okay, so that's what, that's what the A means. It tells you the total impulse, the total kick delivered by the rocket. The 8 is supposed to indicate the average thrust in Newton of the rocket motor while it's firing. But as we'll see, that number is a bit iffy. Um, finally, the three means that there's a time delay of three seconds between the cutoff of the thrust and the ejection charge um, that will deploy the parachute in our rocket. So, A83. Now, here is a, uh, a spec sheet from the National Association of Rocketry for an Estes A8 engine. It's based on, on tests of many engines, and, uh, and we can learn to read it. First of all, we note um, up at the top there is the rated impulse at the top of the A range of 2.5 newton seconds. But the actual measured impulse is a little bit less, 2.32 newton seconds. The, um, the impulse, of course, is the area under the thrust curve, which is given at the bottom. 
Now, the, um, uh, the, the propellant is black powder, and there are about 3.3 grams of propellant in an A8 engine. Now, from the information we've, we've now given, we can actually calculate the specific impulse. The specific impulse is the total impulse divided by the weight of fuel, the mass of the fuel times g, and you work it out, and that's about 72 seconds, right in the range that I gave you for black powder rockets. Now, the, uh, the, um, the burn time for the, uh, um, for the, the, the rocket motor is 0.73 seconds, and the average thrust is 3.18 newtons, which is not very close to the 8 newtons that, um, that is given by the rating. However, notice that although that's the average thrust, the maximum thrust is quite a bit higher. The high initial peak thrust of the, of the rocket motor means that the, the maximum thrust is about 10 newtons. Okay, so, so that raises a few questions. Uh, first of all, is it a rocket engine or a rocket motor? Well, both are correct. A motor is simply a device that makes something move, and a rocket motor certainly does that. An engine is a device for the conversion of energy. It converts energy in some other form, say the chemical energy of the, in, in the rocket fuel, into mechanical energy, say kinetic energy. And it certainly does that. It's both an engine and a motor. The second question is, how does a solid fuel rocket motor do what it does? I mean, what, what accounts, for example, for that, that strange characteristic thrust curve? A lot of thrust right at first, and then a long steady thrust. Um, and, and why are solid fuel rocket motors like this designed to work in that way. Let's take a look at, at the inside of one of these rocket engines. The, uh, the standard size for these engines is 70 millimeters long and 18 millimeters in diameter. This is true for A engines and B engines and some C engines. But some C engines are larger and the D and E engines and so forth are, are, quite, are quite a bit bigger. Um, so, so what have we got? We've got a, uh, the cross-section of the cylinder of the rocket motor. I've just cut it in half. And what do I see? Well, at one end, I can see the ceramic nozzle. It's an expansion nozzle that, um, that helps the rocket act more efficiently. And at the other end, the top end, there's a little bit of ceramic called the head cap. It's much, much thinner. Uh, and on the outside is, a, is the cylindrical paper casing that, um, that, uh, that surrounds the rocket. Now, inside is what's called the propellant grain. That's the black powder that produces the thrust and causes the rocket to accelerate. Um, and uh, there's more or less of it depending on, on what kind of rocket motor you have. But um, in front of the propellant grain, after it in time, because uh, the, the, uh, the propellant burns from the back to the front, is something called the time delay grain. This is something that doesn't produce any thrust, but it, it burns very slowly and produces that three second delay before the parachute charge, uh, which is the ejection charge, um, is, uh, is, is detonated, blowing the head cap off and, um, and, uh, uh, and deploying the parachute in the front of the rocket. One important um, uh, characteristic of the engine is the way that the propellant is configured inside it. So, so the propellant, of course, is a solid. So we can imagine two different ways to pack the propellant in the cylindrical, um, in the cylindrical rocket motor. And the first way is um, where, where there's, a, there's a hole down the middle of the cylinder, um, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the propellant will burn outward. And that's called core-burning propellant grain. The other idea is just to have the propellant um, uh, fill up part of the of the of the the, the volume uh, from from the front, and so it burns from the back, and that's called the end burning propellant grain. And the distinction is important because it tells you how the rocket motor is going to behave. And the main rule for this is the is the um, is the the rule that the engine thrust at any given moment is proportional to the amount of fuel that's being burned, and that of course is proportional to the area of fuel that is undergoing combustion right at that moment. So let me explain what I mean. Consider a core burning propellant grain. 
Well, then, um, at first, only the propellant that's right by the central hole is burning. So the thrust is relatively low. There's not much area in that hole. But as the propellant burns outward, um, uh, that, that hole becomes larger, and a larger and larger area is burning at once, and so the engine thrust increases. And finally, right at the outside, there's a lot of um, um, fuel burning at once, right before the thrust turns off because you've run out of fuel. And so the thrust curve for a core burning propellant grain motor looks like this. It rises quickly and then drops off suddenly. It's a, it's a, a, a steep slope with a cliff at the end. Now let's think about the other case, the end-burning propellant grain. Well, at first, there's a certain area at the back that, that, um, uh, that, that is burning. And as the propellant burns, that area stays the same. And so the, uh, the, um, the thrust curve for an end-burning propellant grain is pretty flat. It's like a plateau. It, uh, it quickly rises to its, its average thrust and pretty much stays at its average thrust for the whole time that it's firing. Now, a typical model rocket is kind of a hybrid between the two. The propellant is, is, uh, um, has a little, a little hole at the beginning, um, at near, near the nozzle, but that hole doesn't go all the way down. It's not a, it's not a core uh, burning um, uh, propellant grain. But let's, um, it, at first it acts like a core burning grain because the combustion area increases as the um, rocket fires, and so the thrust goes up very sharply. But then, the, um, um, uh, at, at, later on, the, it acts more like an end burning grain. The combustion area is about constant for the last part of the flight. So that's why the thrust curve for a model rocket motor has a, a sharp increase to a peak, but then it settles down and has a relatively long plateau during which the thrust is nearly constant. Now let's put that rocket motor in context. We're going to explore the anatomy of a simple model rocket. Now, it may be made of paper and balsa wood and plastic, but nevertheless, it is an interesting piece of technology based on important principles. And there are lots of things that have to work together to make the rocket fly properly. Let's start at the outside of a typical rocket. So, we, uh, we have at the front end a nose cone, and this nose cone is actually detachable. It's not glued on. As we'll see, the nose cone actually will come out during flight. And then behind it is a long cylindrical body, uh, usually a, a paper tube, though you can also use plastic. Attached to the body at the back end, for reasons of aerodynamic stability, are the fins usually three or four of them, usually um, uh, a balsa wood or, or also sometimes lightweight plastic is used. There at the back is the engine peeking out. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then on the side is a little cylinder, like a little piece of, of a drinking straw, called the launch lug. And this is going to have the launch rail uh, passing through it, so, so the um, uh, rocket can be guided as it's being launched. And that means, of course, that the launch lug should not be in line with the fins, because uh, a little steel rod is going to have to go through it. Now let's look at the inside of the, of the uh, rocket body. Um, there on the back, the engine is actually inside something called the motor mount assembly. Uh, and it's a, um, a little bit complicated. Um, it, it always includes uh, one or more centering ring because the diameter of the rocket motor is usually considerably less than the diameter of the, of the rocket itself. And it also has a little metal clip that will hold the rocket motor in place as it fires and as it fires its parachute ejection charge. Now, when it fires the parachute ejection charge, that's going to send hot gases forward, and you don't want to scorch the inside of your rocket or melt your parachute or, or do anything like that. So the next thing forward from the motor mount is some flame-proof wadding. The, the wadding looks like toilet paper, but toilet paper is terrible wadding because the, um, the, the, it needs to be flame-proof. It needs to, uh, to, to keep 
um, hot gases and cinders from catching um, the uh, the forward thing, uh, the forward parts of the rocket on fire. In front of the wadding is the folded up parachute, and this is of course folded up to fit in the rocket tube, but it shouldn't be folded up too much because it's got to be able to deploy. And then um, in front of the parachute is an elastic cord, basically a long straight rubber band called the shock cord, and that's attached to the inside of the body and also to the back of the nose cone. It holds them together when the parachute ejection charge fires. Now where's the parachute attached? Well, the easiest thing to do is actually to attach the parachute to the middle of the shock cord. And that means that when the, um, when the uh, uh, nose cone is, um, is pushed out by the, the ejection charge, then the, the parachute will come with it, and the two parts of the rocket, which are held together by the shock cord, um, will, uh, will come down um, easily. So here is a, uh, a rocket that was built by a group in a previous iteration of this course. Um, and, uh, and we can see some of the characteristics. We can see uh, here's the, uh, the motor mount with the motor clip in the back. Here are the fins. They're made of plastic in this case. Here's the body, the, the launch lug, um, glued on a little crooked, but it still works. Um, the, uh, uh, up here is the nose cone, which detaches. And now you can see inside, you can see the shock cord, which is uh, basically a rubber band. And, um, and we can also see the parachute shroud lines. Uh, they're attached uh, in, in this design to the, uh, to the nose cone. And then in here, if we just pull it out, is the parachute. Okay, so much for the layout of the rocket. Now we need to talk about how it works. Let's think about the flight profile of a, of a typical model rocket flight. Um, what are the events that take place, and in what sequence, and, and how are they related? Well, the first part of the flight profile is the launch and power descent. Once we ignite the rocket motor, usually by an electronic device, then it is, it is um, uh, accelerated upward for um, perhaps a fraction of a second, perhaps a, a few seconds, until it comes to a point where the engine cuts off. Now, during this part of the flight, uh, control of the rocket is provided first by the launch rail, that gets it going in the right direction, and then by aerodynamic stability, by the effect of the, of the fins, the, the, the stabilizing uh, lift forces from the fins. And that's why model rocket motors are designed to give a lot of thrust early, is to get the rocket accelerated to a high enough speed so that, so that the, um, the lift forces can maintain its stability. Now, after, the, uh, after this stage comes um, a, uh, a long period of free flight, where the rocket just flies through the air, subject to gravity and to drag, and, uh, uh, and then there comes a moment where the parachute ejection charge um, fires and the parachute deploys. Now, where that happens on the, uh, on the flight profile is very important. You don't want it to happen when the rocket is still going upward very fast. That would just sort of suddenly slow the rocket down, and, and in fact, the parachute might rip off. And you also don't want it to deploy when the, um, when the rocket is falling quickly down toward the ground for the same reason. And you certainly don't want it to deploy after the rocket hits the ground. So the timing of the parachute ejection charge is crucial. And finally, after the parachute is deployed, the, the rocket drifts down on the, on the parachute much more slowly than it went up. And uh, this means, of course, that if there's a, if there's a, a crosswind, it can be carried um, some considerable distance. So when you're uh, launching a rocket, you need to have plenty of room around you. Flying model rockets is fun and worthwhile all by itself. But maybe we want to do more. Maybe we want to test the rocket, to make measurements of its flight, to, uh, to um, uh, help understand the principles. Well, some of that we can do just by standing on the ground. We can observe its trajectory and so on. But to do more, we, we might need the rocket to carry our experiments. We need our rocket to have a payload. 
if you think about it, the only place to, uh, to put a payload compartment in your rocket is actually as part of the nose assembly. That way, the payload won't get in the way of the parachute ejection charge and will not prevent the parachute from deploying. So the payload compartment comes out with the nose cone at the end of the shock cord. And, um, and, and once you, uh, once you have, have a payload compartment, you can do all kinds of interesting things. Now, of course, we can make observations of the rocket launch using, say, a high-speed video camera um, and, uh, and find the acceleration and so on. But with instruments aboard the rocket, we can find things like the altitude of the rocket. We can get that by ground observations, but it's a lot more fun to get it using an electronic altimeter. Um, and there are several that are made specially to be carried by model rockets. And if we're ambitious, we could also put a video camera on board and get a video of what it's like to ride a model rocket up into the air. Here are a couple of examples of those instruments. This is an electronic altimeter. It will actually record the altitude of the rocket using barometric pressure uh, several times a second during the rocket's flight. And that will let us sort of trace out its, its trajectory, at least in the vertical direction. And, and this, this is a video camera. We can uh, uh, mount this in a transparent section of the rocket's uh, body and, and uh, uh, take, a, take a video of the rocket in flight. Uh, this one we actually, we actually flew in a, previous, uh, in a previous year. An extremely useful tool for um, designing and understanding the behavior of model rockets is the software package Open Rocket, which is a rocket design program and flight simulator. Um, it's, uh, it's free. It uh, works on both Windows and, and Mac computers, and it... Um, uh, and it, it, it really um, um, lets, you, uh, lets you do a lot of sophisticated stuff. So let's take a look. Here's what the program looks like. Um, this is the design window. And down at the bottom, you can see the, um, uh, the, the sort of blueprint of the model rocket all laid out for you. The center of mass is the, uh, is the, the blue circle with the plus in it. The center of pressure is the red circle with the dot in it. And um, uh, at the top, you can see on the left a, uh, a list of the, of the parts of the rocket that we've designed, and on the right, other parts that we might add to the rocket as we go along. Once we've established the rocket design and specified the rocket motor that it flies with, then Open Rocket will allow us to simulate its flight, taking into account both the thrust of the rocket and gravity, as well as drag and, and the aerodynamic stability of the rocket. So uh, we can plot the altitude, velocity, and acceleration of the rocket as a function of time. And of course, then we'd want to fly the rocket to see if our simulation is correct. So that's it. Model rockets are not like um, model battleships. A model battleship is not a real battleship. Model rocket is a real rocket, and the principles of rocket science apply to them as well. And we can see those principles at work, uh, principles of propulsion, of aerodynamic stability, and so on, in the design, construction, and, and operation of model rockets. <laughs>